zooming upwards. Uh, and, and, and of course inflation in many of the other countries around it, in Argentina, and Brazil and so on, has become a real problem. So here you have deflation and there you have inflation. One half of the world is being monetarist and the other half is being Keynesian. Well, we've tried both of those solutions sequentially in time and they didn't work. Now we're trying them geographically, half and half of the world doing this and the other half doing that. Neither of which is going to work. So where's the third solution? And in the China case, they started to cut back. And it's very interesting, just today I read, you know, they started to cut back a few weeks ago and suddenly property prices started to crash in China. They went down by 20% in about three months in some of the key cities in, the, in, in China. And everybody started to panic. And now what has the government done? It's actually gone back and said, okay, banks, lend, lend, lend. Get back into the game. So there's a frantic attempt in China to sort of stabilize things uh, by, you know, by playing the, 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 these games. In the same way what we're seeing in this, country, in, in this part of the world, and in Europe in particular, we're seeing this, this, this incredible game are being played of uh, you know trying to deal with uh, the debt, the sovereign debt problem in a very in very peculiar kinds of ways. So m the point of this is is to say that actually I don't see at this particular point any major alternative in the horizon in terms of what capital can do. On the basis on the basis of what has been going on the last 30 years, I can make some rough predictions as to where things might go. Um, and this is a bit like weather forecasting, where, where I was assured by one of my colleagues who's expert at this, that actually if you say the weather tomorrow is going to be roughly the same as it is today, you'll be right 60% of the time. And there's an immense amount of effort put in to try to get the predictability up to 80% of the time, you know, but 60% of the time, eh, it'll be the same as tomorrow. And, and, and a bit on that basis, what can we really expect? Now, I've already mentioned this, what this seems to be this key switch in the state finance nexus where, put crudely, bond markets dominate sovereign political power. And they're dominating, as we see in Europe, very, very strongly. Uh, we're not seeing it here in the United States, but in effect, that is, that is what's happening here in the United States as well. So if that's the case, then the big question is what's happening in those markets? And, and how can we understand what they're doing and in what direction they are moving? What we're seeing, of course, is it's not only are you actually dominating political power in the way that Bill Clinton recorded it, but what we now see in Europe is if effectively the overthrow of democratically elected governments and the appointment of technicians who are doing the will of the bond markets. Two governments now. Pretty soon, if you don't willingly actually do what the bond markets want, you'll be in that lot too. So what does this mean for democracy? Now, there's a very interesting problem that lies behind this which is really what I want to really emphasize. Capitalism has always been about expansion, for the reasons I've already mentioned. It's always been about growth. Uh, have you ever heard anybody who's pro-capitalist say they're anti-growth? In effect, a crisis is defined as zero growth, right? I mean, since when is zero growth a crisis? I mean, actually, it turns out Zero growth is one of the best things that can happen to the environment, but leave that aside. Historically, the, the volume of goods and services has grown probably around the rate of 2.25% per year, but it's a compound rate of growth. Marx has a wonderful kind of little argument where he kind of says, well, actually, this guy in, in 1780 calculated it. If he had invested a sovereign on the date of the birth of Jesus Christ, there would now be enough sovereigns to actually fill up half of the universe. No, solar system, sorry. That's, bit... that's what compound growth does. 3% compound growth is considered a reasonable kind of way for capitalism to work. 4 or 5% is really good. 
10% people start to, if it's 10% in aggregate, people start to worry about it's overheating and all that kind of stuff. Less than 3%, things are sluggish. Zero, you're in a crisis. I mean, that's the general story you'll get from the financial press. You'll find everybody saying, we've got to get back to 3% growth. Oh, my God, next year there's a forecast in the United States. It's going to be 1.2%. What are we going to do? You know, this kind of stuff. So capital is always about growth, and it's about compound growth. 3% compound growth back in 1780, no problem. 3% compound growth right now, real problem, real problem. Because when you think of the global capitalist economy and where it is, the frontier has closed. I mean, the Soviet Union collapsed. That's now opened up. China has entered the system. There's no, there's no geographical frontier. I mean, okay, parts of Africa haven't yet been fully absorbed, and there are parts of Central Asia, and, but, but relatively. But basically speaking, in the same way there was a big impact when the frontier closed in this country back in the sort of 1890s or whenever. So the frontier, the geographical frontier, has closed. There's no way in which you can expand the system. Now, that doesn't mean there's no geographical outlets because you can go, as was mentioned earlier, do some creative destruction. You can deindustrialize all of the United States, which has happened. You can deindustrialize much of Britain and then you can, you know, turn them all into sort of condominiums and shopping malls and all kinds of things like that. So, yeah, you can readjust the whole geography internally by in intensification and transformation. But one of the things you will notice, and this comes back also to this notion of weather forecasting about tomorrow is going to look like today. One of the things you will notice since the 1970s onwards is that as finance has become more liberated and can go and do its thing, <clears throat> it's become more volatile. It started actually to develop completely new market structures. Many of them are actually rather old, but were very minor, but they became major very quickly, like hedge funds and, and, and the like. And what that suggests is that actually the credit system is in itself generating new market possibilities, new possibilities for the accumulation of wealth. And that is precisely what we've been seeing, of course, in, in, in what's happened in financial markets since the 1990s in particular. And as the credit markets become capable of generating more and more wealth almost internally, people can suck more and more wealth out of it. And much of the concentration of wealth that's occurred uh, in the world has occurred through, of course, sucking wealth out of financial markets. I mean, the hedge funds I mentioned, three billion each. I mean, I thought it was pretty outrageous in 2003 when the leading hedge fund people got 250 million each, but now they get three billion. You know, one of them who got three billion two years ago is having a hard time this year, poor fellow. So I think that, that what we have here is a category that I really like in Marx. It's called fictitious capital. That actually, fictitious capital has always played a very important role in the dynamics of accumulation for the reasons that I've mentioned about, you know, getting from yesterday's, you know, supply to, you know, today's demand kind of thing. But fictitious capital has become much more, more significant in the system. And as fictitious capital has become much more s significant, so what we've seen is a kind of almost a closure of, of what, how that fictitious capital works. Now, when you we use the word fictitious capital, people kind of say, well, it's a very abstract contact, contact, concept. Give me an idea of what you mean. What I mean is this. There's a very interesting positionality of financial institutions. Who lends the money to the developers who build tract housing around San Diego? The financial institutions do. Okay, so the tract housing is built. You know, the laborers get paid. You know, everything goes on. And then at the end of the day, the houses are there. Who do they sell them to? Well, they sell them to, to some people who need a mortgage to buy them. Who provides the mortgage? Well, actually... The same financial institution that, that actually funded the developers also provides the mortgage. And in fact, they had package deals uh, when the, the developers started to develop. Uh, you could go, the financial institution would offer you a deal, you know, where you can get in on it even before it's built. 
you know, things like that, so you could actually... Now, you see what's happening here is that actually the financial institution regulates the supply and the demand. Right? And, of course, because it's regulating the supply and demand, it is also in a position to manipulate prices. And, 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 and as it manipulates prices, and so, so pretty soon, you know, you get the asset bubble in the housing market going on and on and on. And if at the end of the day, the, you know, the financial institution can't find anybody to buy it because they haven't got enough good credit rating, you say, well, instead of 20% down, why don't we say 10% down? And then after a bit, well, instead of 10% down, why not 5% down? After a bit, oh, well, well you know, just, yeah. we get our money out of fees anyway. We don't care about the mortgage. We just package it off and sell it to some unsuspecting municipality in Norway saying it's as safe as houses. And the fact that later on they won't be able to pay their police service is too bad. So this is, a, this is, this is the way fictitious capital works. And what we've seen are more and more signs of fictitious capital operating in this way and immense wealth being extracted in this way by certain classes in a society. And along with that goes a tremendous concentration of wealth. And what we've seen, as everybody obviously knows, over the last 30 years is tremendous concentrations of, 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 of wealth and, and, and income, and, and that wealth and income then has tremendous implications for the wielding of political power. So you end up with a, a, the with a, with a following prediction, that if this system continues and we do not make any radical changes in it, and I see no sign of any radical changes coming uh, from, from pretty, pretty much any quarter, if we make no radical changes in it, we're simply going to perpetuate in which one half of the world is going to be actually drawing immense wealth on the basis of fictitious operations, while the rest of us will be looking for enough to eat. And we know already the amount of poverty and the amount of Hunger amongst children in this country has been increasing, and we will see that in many other parts of the world. So here's, here's if you like, that one scenario. And, and where, but then you ask the question, who is, who, is really, who is really kind of confronting the dynamics of that scenario and, and is, is able to tell us exactly why it's happening in the way it's happening? This is, takes a lot of hard work and a lot of hard thinking. And um, frankly, we just don't have institutes of thinking that actually are prepared to grapple with these, these sorts of questions in the, in, in the degree they need to be grappled with. I mean, I, I try and do my little bit, but, you know, I'm pretty isolated. You know, and, and certainly I, I would never get interviewed on any of the mainstream media, and, and I pretty much get isolated, you know. Not, not true in Britain, by the way. I get on the BBC, but, you know. Uh, the BBC still has a residual of something or other that doesn't exist in this country. So, so you look at that, and 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 you kind of look at a, at a rather rather dismal situation. The other possibility would be the China model, which will take will will will, will take root. And it's interesting. There are a number of think tanks in this country. And I've been reading the. the commentaries, on my, many of which are beginning to say, you know, this, this big stuff that's going on is so big that uh, obviously democracy can't work. That we need these macro decisions to be made by a, an elite group of, of people. And in fact, we need to set up a form of governance in this country which rather parallels that of China. I mean, people are seriously, they don't say it that way, but in, in effect, that's what they're saying. Uh, because all this democracy in Washington is screwing things up. I mean, look at it. It's just a mess. And, and, and so what we'll do is we'll have democracy will be local. <coughs> you can, you know, be democratic about what trees get planted in your, in your park or something like that. But, but you know, 